Hi, my name is Amber Heights, and I'm the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer at the ACLU. The American Civil Liberties Union is a nonpartisan organization with affiliates across the country that work to advance equality, fairness, and freedom for all people. Whether we're fighting to reduce mass incarceration, demanding sweeping reforms to the criminal legal system, improving voting access, or strengthening reproductive care for all, the ACLU is doing the serious, focused, necessary work of protecting and expanding civil liberties. The ACLU has continued to be transformative with powerful equity initiatives to shift culture and engage communities both inside and outside of the organization. And at the ACLU, we expanded the traditional celebration of Black History Month and pivoted to a new framework that reimagines tomorrow, Black Futures Month. Black Futures Month gives us an opportunity to think beyond what has been and envision what can be. It's an opportunity to continue elevating the legacy of Black people while reminding each other that we are manifesting a new future of justice, of joy, and of liberation. This program, the future of Black political impact, embodies that spirit and catapults us into this movement that is centered on action. I do want to acknowledge the activists, organizers, historians, legal minds, and advocates who are viewing this conversation. Those of us who are committed unapologetically, unwaveringly, to the pursuit of justice. I want us to remember that when Dr. King told us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, he was compelling us not to be patient, but to be persistent. And so when we see a system that seems too big or feels too big to change, I ask us to hold fast to those words and the knowledge that we are not waiting for that arc. We are bending it collectively, courageously, continuously. All of us have the power to bend it. Before we begin this specific discussion, I want to take a moment to introduce the ACLU's latest campaign, Systemic Equality. Systemic Equality is a racial justice agenda that addresses America's legacy of racism and discrimination through policy and local advocacy, through legal strategy and internal alignment to address the generations of harm created by oppressive economic, social and government policies while advancing solutions to root out injustice. And now we'll hear from one of the ACLU's own, Rakeem Brooks. Thanks, Amber. My name is Rakeem Brooks, and I'm a senior campaign strategist at the ACLU. I'm here to provide a quick overview of our systemic equality platform. Since our nation's founding, America has maintained policies and practices calculated to ensure power inequities and class divisions, and race has been at the center of that strategy. We began with slavery, and then there was Jim Crow and federally enforced segregation. Today, we live with mass incarceration and a host of other policies that purposefully prevent Black Americans from equal access to employment, education, and housing. And we all know that Black people aren't getting a fair shot in the legal system. Our systemic equality agenda includes specific policy asks of the Biden-Harris administration and Congress that will advance societal equity and empower civic participation. It will also close the racial wealth gap and seek reconciliation for America's racist past. Our platform includes protecting and expanding voting rights, expanding access to essential financial services using the post office, student loan debt cancellation, establishing an enhanced and permanent child tax credit, furthering fair and affordable housing, extending high-speed internet access across the country, and passing legislation on reparations. We'll also be engaged in litigation to promote equity in the use of artificial intelligence. We're going to strike down laws that criminalize black and brown students. We intend to address barriers to reentry for returning citizens, and we're going to tackle redistricting so that communities elect their representatives, not the other way around. But this will not only be a nationally focused agenda. The ACLU Southern Affiliates, which we call the collective, will be front and center in this fight as they focus on strengthening voting rights and democracy in the South, ensuring reproductive justice, and continuing the fight for reparations. Finally, I'm proud to say that the ACLU is proactively working internally to align ourselves with these external goals. We're making a commitment to ensure that Black people are promoted, elevated, and more prominent across our organization. Our ambitious systemic equality agenda will ensure that all people living in America, no matter their race, gender identity, disability, religion, or creed, have equal access to our country's promises of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We look forward to your support and participation. Please visit aclu.org slash systemic equality and join our people power movement for more information and actions that you can take. And now for our Black Futures discussion, the future of Black political impact with a stellar panel moderated by my friend, the ACLU of Louisiana's executive director, Alana Odoms. 
you're really in for a treat. Alana? Thank you so much. I am Alana Odoms, Executive Director of the ACLU of Louisiana. Welcome, welcome everyone to the ACLU's Black Futures series. Today, we are gathering to hear from an esteemed panel of leaders to collectively discuss the future of Black political impact. Where are we now and where we're going? We have a panel of diverse leaders today in two sessions. But before we begin, I want to introduce any newcomers here to the ACLU. The ACLU is a 101-year-old organization dedicated to protecting and defending the civil rights and civil liberties of all citizens. Basically, what that means is we slay in courts, in Congress, and in community. Today is a new day in our political environment. Black people have played a significant part of crafting the election results that we've seen, and there was an unprecedented political participation across America. And many of the leaders that are going to be speaking with us today had a significant role in making that happen. So let's meet them. Tanika Boyd, our very own, is the National Organizing Director and Deputy Political Director at ACLU's National Political Action Department, which we call MPAD. She is the former senior advisor at Color of Change PAC, and she was chief of staff there in that role. She was also the national director of Leaders of Color Initiative, where she recruited and trained Black and Latino people seeking public office. Welcome, Tanika. Thanks for having me. Crystal Cooper. Glad to have you, sis. Crystal Cooper is currently the director of communications for March for Our Lives, an organization that harnesses the power of Gen Z to end gun violence in America and has ignited the highest percentage of youth voter turnout ever. She has served as communications advisor in New York City to Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration, and she led media strategy on gender equality issues for the ACLU, including the landmark marriage equality case before the United States Supreme Court of Obergefell. Welcome, Crystal. And Lee, hey, Merritt. Welcome. <laughs> Lee Merritt, uh, many of you know Lee, he is a dynamic and renowned civil rights attorney in this nation. He has represented the family of several high profile cases of victims of police violence and murder, including both of John and Tatiana Jefferson, who were each murdered in their own homes by off duty and unidentified police officers. Uh, he has also represented the family of Ahmaud Arbery, who was killed while jogging. Lee is co-counsel to the family of George Floyd, and he is also the founder and director of Grassroots Law Project and Limitless Resources, which provides mental health resources for families who have experienced police violence. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. And finally, and last but certainly not least, the one and only Dashika Ruffin. Nishika has been at the forefront of some of our nation's most historic and consequential political campaigns. Now, y'all listen to this lineup. Doug Jones for Senate, Ayanna Presley for Congress, Elizabeth Warren for President, Hillary Clinton for America, as well as Obama for America, and most recently delivering to us our first African-American uh, senator from the great state of Georgia. She was senior advisor to Raphael Warnock's Senate campaign. Girl, this is, <laughs> that is amazing. Dashika previously served as our very own Southern Regional Director for the ACLU's Campaign for Smart Justice, where she focused on voter enfranchisement in Florida for formerly incarcerated people and ending mass incarceration in Louisiana and across the South. Welcome, Dashnika. It's so good to be with my ACLU family again. Thank you. We're so happy to have you back. And um, we are, we're we're going to kick this conversation off. We have three incredible dynamic ladies and a, and a fantastic gentleman. But we're going to talk about the ladies for a second here. We have a new president. We have a new vice president a first South Asian and Black woman of color. We have 27 Black women in Congress. We are, we're at a place, we're in a new dawn, a new day, to quote uh, from the infamous, uh, uh, infamous song. But this didn't happen overnight. I want to talk specifically to Dashika and Crystal first. 
what are the things in your respective work that you believe got us to this incredible moment in our nation's history? Yeah, so Alana, you you hit the nail on the head when you're when you open. This moment didn't happen overnight, right? The electoral success that we're seeing in this country, especially in Georgia, was a harvest of decades of labor performed by organizers in their community, mostly black and black uh, black and brown people. And so we're literally seeing the embodiment of the phrase when preparedness meets opportunity. For us in Georgia, this journey has expanded over five to six years. We knew the demographics of our state was changing rapidly. Thanks to the brilliance of people like me, Stacey Abrams, um, we capitalized on those changes, right? And so even in defeat, we kept working, we kept expanding the electorate, we kept registering people to vote, we kept educating and turning them out. And so one thing I love to say is culture and strategy for breakfast. Right. You can have the best PowerPoint, the best campaign plan, the best analysis. But if you can't move people, you're never going to be successful. And so we had to meet people where they are. We have to speak their language. And so the difference in this moment, it wasn't just about politics. We, you know, we literally met people where they were. People were legit fighting for their survival. Healthcare was on the ballot. Jobs like equality, healthcare, freedoms all were on the ballot. And so we were connecting the power of the people's vote to the change they wanted to see. So it wasn't about rhetoric or or just happenstance and pomp and hamperstance. It was about real change, quantifiable change. We saw people and we met them where they were and they saw themselves in the process. And so when you can inspire people to dream and hope and, and just really be in the moment in their lowest moment, that's where the real power comes over. And so, again, while we have some really great candidates this cycle, you know, I happen to work for one of them. Um, it wasn't about a Calvary coming to save us. We were that Calvary. We were taking back the power. We were taking back the power for our people, for our families, our communities. And I think that's the movement you saw across the country. And that's what got us to where we are. Crystal, weigh in here on what Dashika said about the power, taking back that power and it being really deeply rooted in community. A hundred percent. So much of what you said um, resonates, Dashika, and I think um, was a component to what works so well for March for Our Lives. So I'll take a little bit of a step back and say that um, what worked for us was really being grounded in the recognition that this election wasn't about the end or a victory. It was merely the beginning of a new era in which we'd hopefully have fewer limitations and greater possibilities. Um, So it was about shifting the landscape in our favor for the next four years. And something that you said was taking back that power. Um, From the communications perspective, we sought to give voice to this generational perspective where young people are not single issue voters, right? They're single vision voters. Um, That vision is of a peaceful, thriving, healthy, inclusive future. So we built coalition, I would say, first with... um, fellow um, youth-focused and youth-serving organizations. So those were our comrades at United We Dream, at the Sunrise Movement, Dream Defenders. Um, These are the issues and the challenges that are really shaping a generation and our generational identity. And from there, we just focused on building up our power. Um, When we're talking about Gen Z, we're talking about folks who are 18 to 25 years old, many of them first-time voters, and... um, they didn't need to be convinced of their power. They just needed to be reassured of all of these wins that they had over the course of, you know, even the Trump era to show what they could do at the ballot box. So our signature um, election 2020 campaign was called Our Power. And it was all about translating the power of movements to power at the polls. Um, So many points, like I mentioned during the Trump presidency, um, the March for Our Lives um, march, the 2018 original march in Washington is one of them where youth demonstrated their power. Um, In the 2018 midterms, um, we flipped seats, we elected the squad. Um, That was kind of like a practice round for the general election. And then youth, of course, what we saw in summer 2020, um, took to the streets for a new revolution. Um, So it was all about channeling that power and getting folks out. And the last thing I'll mention is that it's kind of the thing that ties it all together that we felt was really successful. Um, Youth have a deep recognition 
um, of the role that historical role that movements have played um, in getting elected leaders to champion progressive policy. So our friends at the Sunrise Movement, for example, they put out an excellent mobilization video right before the election that drew the parallels between the moment we're in and the moment that Martin Luther King Jr. and civil rights leaders and folks were in in the 60s with, you know, President Johnson and um, the role of movement then and now is not merely to elect, but to create the political will um, where maybe there was none before to do things like pass some gun um, reform and legislation. So everything we did was in service of that real opportunity beyond November 3rd. And that's what folks are really excited to use their power towards. Crystal, that, that's so empowering. And so I wanna ask Tanika and also bring Lee into the conversation um, we had so much to motivate us and catalyze that energy. How do we keep people as inspired, as focused, and as motivated without all of that kind of energy and noise to respond to? And how do we add to what's been built thus far? Tanika, I'll ask you first. Yeah, every day, I think, as Black people, we are adding to the world as it should be, right? Like, I grew up in community with Black folks, and I believe to whom much is given, much is required, and that it was our duty to build on our ancestors' legacy. And Black folks know that. There is no permanent enemy, no permanent ally. And so we are here, as Crystal said, for a vision of the future. It is not about representation alone or representation for representation's sake. We know that representation isn't power. Power is power. And so that is at the center of the story that we want to be able to tell our grandchildren. And that is the story that we want our grandchildren uh, to tell their grandchildren. So um, I think at the heart of it, Black folks know that there will be politicians that disappoint us. Um, there will be politicians that, that fall short. Um, but we are constantly keeping up that drumbeat because we believe that there is a better future and we know that we're on borrowed time and it is our duty to keep up and to keep going. I think there is a little bit of fatigue though, right? Because we spent the past four years, obviously uh, before that, but really the past four years have been really challenging for a lot of us. Um, and there is kind of this moment of reprieve that we have, but I think it is just, it's, it's just central to movements and it's central to um, black folks and black movements to continue that drumbeat, to hold folks accountable and to keep marching towards the world as it should be. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I wonder if we could kick it over to Lee for a second and shift gears just for a minute and, and talk about, um, you know, in 2020, we saw such a seismic shift in the American consciousness. Um, Juneteenth was recognized for the first time in our nation's history, which is shocking and unbelievable. Um, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima finally got their retirement papers. They got their walking papers in 2020. Companies and colleges are being called out on racism and structural racism. The term Karen became a mainstream archetype. Um, and reparations is no, no longer a taboo concept. It also seems as though Black people are starting to be believed, obviously, especially when there are cameras involved, involving police brutality. And we have some convictions, very few, but some convictions happening around police misconduct. We also have the Justice and Policing Act being taken seriously. So I want to ask you directly, because you come directly from the front lines of this movement on police accountability and from a litigation perspective, what are we on the verge of changing and where do we need to be setting our sights for long systemic reform and police accountability? Well, I think it's important that we continue to track the families that, that brought us here. It, it was saying the names of people like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery that woke up the national consciousness. And, and it's, a, it's not enough to win a couple of elections or to see uh, just a bit of progress. We want, we want to see outcomes for the family of Breonna Taylor. We want to see convictions for George, um, for George Floyd and, and where the law does not uh, make that easy, uh, where qualified immunity blocks uh, civil accountability where the federal government has its hands tied uh, due to our archaic laws in terms of accountability and where the Department of Justice and the federal government can reach. We need to see that change. And so there's some laws in the books that we're pursuing now, like the Justice 
Justice and, uh, and, and Policing Act or the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that you mentioned. Uh, but just like any corporation or any other business, when we try to when we are pushing towards outcomes, it needs to be something that is specific, measure and measurable. And so. Uh, with these specific families, we need to continue to push their cases to the forefront and ensure a just outcome. And where the law doesn't um, facilitate a just outcome, we need to change those specific laws. Um, and, and, uh, right now, we live in the deadliest police culture in the world. That's by the data that there's no other modern nation that kills or incarcerates more of its citizens. And that's something that we can address. We know that five out of eight people can go home from prison today without adding, without uh, making our, our communities less safe. In fact, they make them stronger. Uh, and we know that there are officers like the, the officer who murdered Tatiana Jefferson or George Floyd who, who need to be held accountable in departments that need to be revamped. And as long as we tie our attention to the specific outcomes in that case, I think we'll be moving in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you're speaking about, um, you know, what we need to do as far as uh, systemic reform and how we need to go about, um, you know, involving people in the movement. And so I actually want to um, ask a question and I'm going to be kind of like singing the, the tune to the rest of the development in my head while I'm saying it. And this is kind of open to everyone. But what can everyday people do? How do we bring everyday people into this tent and help them understand their power to be involved in movements for revolution, um, movements for black liberation, of course, police accountability as well. Lee, I'm happy for you to, to give a comment there and then I'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Well, as, as our leaders have said for so long since the 60s, it's, it always starts from the, gra the ground, grassroots up. And so these movements, although they're national, and it's great to see that the, the members of Congress are speaking on these issues and pursuing policies and legislation, um, it is, it's also important that that we on a or oh, that we on a grassroots level um, participate in, for example, our, our local school boards uh, show up to our city council meetings, uh, uh, participate in jury duty. We won't see uh, significant outcomes until we activate people on a local level and know that, that that's that's year round. It's not just election time. It's not just um, you know during the presidential election, but that there are ways that you can get involved in your community. That there's a local chapter of the NAACP or Urban League or Until Freedom or Grassroots Law Project, that, that, that these are organizations that you can sign up for full time uh, to create change on a local level. And I think as, as we see more concrete change on a local level and more people involved um, with changes to our educational system, um, again, at the local level, then it'll spill over nationally. Wonderful. And let's add ACLU to that list. And I see Dashika wanting to jump in. <laughs> Go ahead, Dashika. <laughs> but no, I think Lee is exactly right, right? The real work starts in the off-season. You don't wait until the elections come, right? You do the work now. And so I, I think that, you know, part of building power now, it starts on the local level. You know, you don't wait for the presidential election cycle to, to kind of come in. And then also, it's not just about getting people elected, right? It's about holding them accountable. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times that I talk to people and it's like, people think the elected officials are like these mythical, you know, magical creatures that live in an ivory tower that you know get elected and you never hear from again, right? Um, I have been blessed to be doing campaigns for over 20 years. Um, I know elected officials are pretty much every level of government and some are my family, right? But don't think for one moment that I won't call them or send a letter. I love sending a right, real good letter. I'm a letter writer. But, you know, it's about keeping people accountable. Um, I remember uh, on the Warnock campaign, um, I kept what we call the promise document, right? And it's a list of everything he promised to do uh, during the election cycle. And so I don't know how many of you guys grew up with a Black mama or a Black uh, grandmother. And so what is universal in the Black community, there is a phrase we have all heard at one point in time I brought you in this world and I can take you out. And so I use that same concept in my voting power, right? Like I help get you elected. And if you no longer represent my needs and the community's needs and doing the people's business, I will help take you out. And so I think we just really need to like, it's not about just getting people elected. You don't give away your political power um, uh, willy-nilly, right? Like you keep your necks on the people that, got, that you got elected, right? 
And so I think it's just continuing that effort, um, holding people accountable, and, and that work just continues on. Absolutely. Is there anybody else who wanted to jump in there? Yeah, I'll jump I can. in, Alana, if you don't. Uh, go ahead. Either either way works. Well, we'll take Tanika and then Crystal. Awesome. I was going to say, as an organizer, I just wanted to double down on, on Lee and Dashika's point that this movement, um, these movements have always been uh, led by everyday people. You know, John Lewis was an everyday person before he became a congressman. Rosa Parks was an everyday woman before she became the Rosa Parks. And so it's really antithetical to say that, you know, these, these movements aren't being led by everyday people, you know? Um, nothing moves without Black people. Nothing is cool, nothing is powerful, nothing is interesting without Black people. Beyonce don't get a number one album without Black folks. Long nails don't become trending without Black folks. And, and Joe Biden doesn't become president without the, without the great Black women um, across this country. And so um, that is the power that we hold, that is the power that we always envision that is the power that we are trying to keep and to grow. And that is really, you know, on the backs of everyday people like my mother, who is a working class woman. She's probably at work right now in the factory. Um, she's going to be at, at church in two days uh, as an usher. Um, and right, like she's an everyday person, as everyday as an everyday person can be. She probably has a Michelle Obama toe bag and watching, watching Wolf Blitzer uh, in the evening. But Things are moving because my mother and people like my mother get involved every day. She goes to Lee's point to see about the, the school board. She goes to figure out which judges, which decisions are being made because she has a son who's incarcerated. She is thinking about all the ways um, that a place like Milwaukee County franchises or disenfranchises her in all the myriad of ways. And so when we think about Black political power, we think about the everyday person. We think about everyday Black people who have always been the backbone of our movements. Oh, absolutely. And I, I'm thinking about your mother right now, Tamika, and you're exactly right. Everyday Black men and women um, who really have been the perfectors of this democracy in so many, um, so many ways. Crystal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will just like to add on a little bit to what everyone was saying. And I think um, I work with young people. The young people say it all the time. So I will say it on their behalf um, that, you know, Gen Z is not here to save you. And that the way they see it, if you have another 40 years left on this earth, another 30, another 15, then you need to be playing a role in building that future, too. Um, and so um, go back to something that Lee was saying about like the school board meetings and just being really involved in your community. When we look at the issue of gun violence in particular, this is such a localized issue. We've been waiting on the federal government to pass basic gun safety measures for decades. Um, and unfortunately, the more time that goes by and the deeper our political divisions become, ironically, uh, the more these solutions that seem like common sense um, just become harder and harder to pass despite widespread support. And we can't wait forever. So those communities who are most affected by gun violence, black and brown communities struggling with everyday gun violence, um, they're struggling with the kind of gun violence that an assault rifle ban or uni universal background checks won't necessarily solve. Um, and these are the communities that just straight up need resources. They need violence intervention funding. They need public school funding. They need stable, affordable housing. So these are the everyday struggles of folks. And so for people wanting to get involved, you know, do research on your city and state budget and share what you find and encourage others in your community to lobby those elected officials or keep keep uh, your foot on their necks about it and build power from the ground up from your living room. And I think I'm encouraged by the fact that I'm seeing, you know, just on my own social media timeline, so many movements modeling this DIY approach in this moment. And I think it's sending an important message to the everyday people that getting these big policy solutions passed is not a Washington centric conversation. It's about what's happening in Detroit, in LA, in Chicago, in Milwaukee, and what you can do about it. Absolutely. I, I want to talk about a specific um, policy issue that um, John Conyers has brought up over the last 40 years. 
you know, talking about being steadfast and having perseverance and not merely um, responding to the political climate of the moment. Um, let's talk about HR 40. And I want to hear Tanika's voice on this specifically. Um, ACLU has, supports HR 40 in the formation of a commission that will study the effects of slavery and make recommendations to Congress on how we address those things. There was a hearing a couple of days ago, but people are still now just learning and acknowledging the effects of Jim Crow and slavery on our country. And we've had um, some of our most kind of um, um, thought provoking scholars and leaders kind of talk to us about these issues, Tana Hesse Coates, Nicole Hannah Jones. But what are people in your circle saying? And how do we actually start to have this conversation among um, a broader group of people so that we completely revolutionize this conversation? That is such a good question. Um, I think the first thing I'll say is I would be remiss to say uh, if I didn't say that people should join peoplepower.org, uh, which is our uh, site to, to you know, become more involved and engage in this work. Because as you stated, ACLU is taking on uh, systemic equality and thinking through fair housing, thinking through reparations, thinking through how we close the racial wealth gap with a student debt relief, thinking through just all the ways that um, these systems have disempowered Black people um, and really have closed the middle class to so many Black folks. Um, so that is one to make sure that folks get engaged. Um, I would say people, they clearly didn't grow up with my dad because my dad was standing on street corners with a bullhorn talking about reparations. Um, and for so long, it was a niche issue um, in Black communities. Um, and, you know, we knew you were down if you had a stick, a bumper sticker on your car. Um, but we have to destigmatize reparations. We have to talk about it um, in rooms and ways so that people understand that this is, you know, this is about dismantling systemic equality. This is about making sure that uh, the dream and the promise of America is available and open to Black people. And that for well over 400 years, this country has uh, taken policies that have strategically uh, left Black people out. ta Coates blew the lid off with the Atlantic article when he talked about housing and he talked about how home ownership was really stripped from Black people. And the idea of reparations at the core of it, at the heart of it, is about restoring what Black folks um, were supposed to have um, and to make sure that Black folks have access to all these systems that America continues to say is really the gateway to the middle class. But so many generations of Black folks did not have access to that. So I think in order to make sure that so many people are kind of lumped in and understand um, what's at the core of it. We have to center the narratives of Black people. We have to center the narratives of working class Black women. We have to center the narratives of people who have multi-generation incarcerated. And so we have to talk about reparations as a recovery effort to Black people, um, as a debt owed, as not just about economic relief, but dismantling the systems so that um, we don't continue the next 400 years with this kind of level and layer of oppression that Black folks were under and are under. Absolutely. And just to take that even a step further to help folks recognize that um, systemic inequality is actually as harmful for our collective prosperity, um, and even more so if we actually focus on um, creating equality and you know eliminating the wealth gap that actually has a power to lift everyone it's not the uh you know lifting all boats and the, the smaller boats will rise but it is that we're missing out on huge areas of opportunity for prosperity because the wealth gap continues to be as wide as it is and because we've left an entire generation and community out of that prosperity um, so well put, Tanika. I wonder if anyone else had any thoughts on HR 40 and the advocacy around reparations. Lee? 
Yeah, I, I would just add, and, and again, it's just echoing what uh, our sister Boyd just said. We we want to pull the conversation out, like acknowledge the history and the systemic oppression, but also understand the current impact that it has today. That uh, following, you know, the the chattel slavery period, there was a brief Reconstruction uh, era, uh, and and then our government, our government went about systemically finding ways to marginalize the black community. Community and that hasn't stopped. We have current policies on our books that you can draw a straight line from this from the plantations uh, to to the mass incarceration. You can draw a straight line from the plantations to mass surveillance and the open air prison systems uh, in the communities that I grew up in in Los Angeles, where we were redlined and where uh, we remain redlined in those communities. And so when people when people hear the word reparations, they shouldn't have to you know think back. 100 years, 200 years, 400 years, they can think about uh, the the largest prison industrial complex in the history of human, uh, uh, of recorded history, I'm sorry, um, uh, that we currently live under, that this is a, that, that these are all symptoms of a, a, a system, systemically oppressive system that remains, and that when we hear things like the war on drugs that is ongoing, that, that, that how that plays out through our criminal justice system is a war on black and brown people. Uh, and that it, when we when we call for reparations, we're calling for not only um, payment for the, the 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 labor of our ancestors, but freedom from from the oppression of our government that keeps us in in, um, um, in, in the same sort of hole that we started in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, we talk about those drawing those direct lines from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration to today. You know, it is no surprise that the former um, slaveholding states of the Confederacy occupy the top 10 states in highest incarceration rates in the nation. But we don't think about it in that way. Um, also, this idea of the drained pool politics, the zero sum game, there's a really beautiful book out right now by Heather McGee, where um, she documents. Um, a horrible massacre that happened in Louisiana, Colfax, Louisiana, where after Reconstruction, um, rioters came and burned down the courthouse and the seat of government in order to prevent uh, an African-American person who had been elected from holding that seat. And think about that direct correlation with what happened on January 6th and the fact that folks would be willing to burn down, to, to destroy, to defile the seat of our American democracy, simply because we wanna open up a multiracial and multi-ethnic democracy. That is what we have to remember. This is not new. This is all in our history. And so I wanna shift us to this conversation around divisiveness, right? Um, Joe Biden spoke about how corrosive racism is and we're going to be putting forward the systemic equality platform to him to address um, hopefully what we're going to call the final reconstruction, right? We don't want another reconstruction because that means this one didn't work just like the last one didn't work. But that also means uniting this country, 74 million people who had a different perspective, who saw a different side than what we're speaking about now. Somebody, anybody, please talk to me about reunification. Talk to me about how do we go forward as a as a nation unified with a new idea around telling a full American history and a new American story? I mean, I, <laughs> that is such a tough question because, you know, I think before November, I would have this utopian, um, you know, answer. Right. But like looking at the electoral map on Election Day on November, it was just clear of how many people were never going to be able to convince. I come from a state where, you know, I won't mention her name, but there are, are newly elected ultra right con congresswomen, you know, from middle Georgia. There's a lot more people like her. Right. And so like the previous occupant of the White House, he didn't create racism. He didn't create this divisiveness. He gave them cover. And he emboldened them for them to come out of the shadows, right? And so while I think it is important to, to kind of work in a bipartisan manner, I think it's ultimately important, and that's what we saw in this electoral moment, of making sure that you're covering the base for your base, right? You have to take care of home before you can even extend the arm or the olive branch. And so I think, you know, when we're talking about this political power, um, really making sure that your agenda 
represents the people that you are representing, right? And that's what brings people into the fold. Um, I, as a kid, my mom, my mom, which is my grandmother, for all the people who did not grow up in the country, told me that, you know what? Everyone is not for you and you are not for everyone. And it doesn't make it, it it's not that it's anything wrong. It just means that everyone is not going to understand where you are. Right. So if you continue in the mode that you are, you, you extend that olive branch, you have real open conversations. We we're talking about repara- uh, reparations. Right. And I want to mention this. We're not even at a point where we can actually have an honest conversation. H.R. 40 is not creating reparations. It's creating study. We haven't even got to the point of the study. Right. And so while we can talk utopian. I'm the I'm probably the most optimistic person you will ever meet. It is about making sure that you are taking care of your base first and then extending the olive branch. And so, yes, walk work across the aisle, um, uh, work in bipartisan manners, but you can't force someone to believe in your existence. You can't force someone to believe that you um, deserve you know, basic fundamental rights, right? And so taking care of your base first is important to me. Absolutely. Tanika? Yeah, I'll jump in here quickly and say, um, this is where white allyship goes to work. Um, Because this is in my ministry. Um, This is in my work uh, to patchwork folks who were very content by the millions uh, with dismantling every civil right that I had and my grandparents had. But this is really the work of the allies to go get their folks, to have conversations at the Thanksgiving table, to talk in depth, to go through these trainings, to get in community with marginalized groups, get some training, um, and go get their people. Uh, Because this isn't necessarily our work. I don't believe that marginalized people, specifically Black people, um, even more specific Black queer people, um, should should be in harm's way to build a different America. Um, we have paid that debt in full. We don't owe any more. Uh, but this is the work of the folks who said, especially during the summer, that they were going to lock arms and be allies. I need them to go get their people. Absolutely. Do you mind if I just jump in? Yes, um, please. Absolutely. Come on. Is- Come on, sis. Come through. There's something that Dashika said that I'm like, I'm so glad you said it first because I didn't want to be the one out the gate to say it. But when I hear this question, my follow up, like the follow up question that comes to mind is who are we considering when we're talking about unity and unifying? Um, Particularly because, like you said, Dashika, I'm worried about keeping that broad coalition that helped get Biden elected together, because even that is holding on by a thread. And the only pathway to do that is to deliver some real wins and some tangible improvements to the people who made it possible. That's how we build the momentum and hold this coalition together. If we end up in gridlock over things that should be common sense, like honestly centric policies, because you said we can't even get to reparations, long overdue policies like gun control, which a majority of Americans support, like raising the minimum wage, this coalition is going to fissure and crumble. And when we look at like young people, black people, (laughs) we were the ones who were messaged to about this election, that this was a once in a lifetime election, that this the, the circumstances and the conditions that led to 2020 might not happen again. Um, And so we were put in this position where it was up to us to save democracy. And if the stakes are lower next time, you know, or if we don't see any bold action or any tangible change on the community level, um, that all but guarantees the collapse of our coalition. Um, so the only way to get through the dis- this divisiveness is with a focus on delivering the real wins for the people and the communities who got us here, knowing that, knowing that it's going to impact in a positive way the folks beyond our coalition as well, right? It's gonna, it's going to positively impact um, some of the folks who at least voted for Trump. I don't know about, I can't speak for the people who showed up at the Capitol riot, but um, you know, these these wins will benefit all, and we have to focus on those. Crystal, I am so glad that you're talking about um, the impact of Gen Z. So I have a question specifically for you about this age demographic of 18 to 25. 
we know that young people have always been at the forefront of changing history and leading movements for social change, not just nationally, but also globally. Um, can you talk about what role you find? And we already know you said Gen Z feels like, look, we're not here to save you. But talk about what what role they do have or they do believe they inherit in this new space. And let's talk about midterms. Let's talk about 2024. We know that while this was the election of our lifetime, it's likely that we might end up in 2024 in a circumstance with a person who might not have the same um, overt um, dog whistle um, racism and, and, and policy that we saw from a previous administration. But there may be more subtle nuance, uh, you know, racism and things of that nature that can be easily, easily um, misunderstood or confused. And so. Talk to me about the role of Gen Z and how we continue to uh, allow this group to to lead this movement. A hundred percent. I'm I consider myself very lucky to kind of interact with and consider Gen Z, um, you know, my my peers and colleagues day to day. There are a couple of things I'm seeing uh, that provide some insight, I think, as to how this may play out. Um, and you have to remember that they have come up politically in a time where there feels like this huge vacuum of real leadership and ownership and, you know, clear eyed vision about a way forward. So one of the most significant things I'm just seeing them do in general is to model the changes that they want to see from their government rather than waiting on government to come up with a solution. Um, I'm sure, you know, we're just coming off of, you know, Texas recovering from the storm where we saw a lot of mutual aid resources shared. And I think that mutual aid programs in general are a really excellent example of this because through these networks, young people are providing this safety net that they expect the government to provide. Um, they're showing what it means and what it looks like to shift resources to support urgent needs of the most vulnerable populations. Um, and so when we think about even the, you know, the movement to defund the police and invest in community, the mutual aid work that they're doing throughout the country, um, you know, at this widespread level and hyper local level is already the blueprint for taking that approach at scale, you know, put money that is in excess and not serving a purpose into, um, you know, this, this space where it can actually make an improvement in people's lives. Um, and I think like ultimately they're tired of playing the game of politics. You know, they're not counting tallies and keeping score. They want to see these wins in communities, not just on paper. Um, and also the thing that gives me hope is that they really want to see a compassionate government. Um, I think even through mutual aid, like they model a very profound love for humans and people. Um, and they're really invested in creating that idea of a beloved community that, you know, Martin Luther King so famously discussed where people can thrive even at a gun, you know, even at a gun violence prevention organization, they see that as being the key to this like future where people don't decide to pick up a gun to solve their problems. Right. Um, and then I guess like on the specific kind of electoral level, um, I think one thing that's really exciting to see is young people in Gen Z looking to impacted people as experts and leaders. Um, for them, authentic representation is the impacted leading um, and gaining power. And, you know, we're seeing that shift and like modeling that shift internally at March for Our Lives. Um, when we think about gun violence prevention, we're really lucky to have a champion in Congresswoman um, Lucy McBeth of Georgia, um, who lost her son to gun violence. And it's a different dynamic. It's a fundamentally different dynamic than electing some sort of, you know, well off, well connected statesman, you know, to model the to model and like um, voice the concerns of constituents that they themselves can't really relate to. Um, and I would say that it's really it's really impressive to see those changes manifest so quickly because I feel like it's really started to happen in like the last two or three years. I hope folks were um, or had their notebooks and was taking down notes because Crystal just dropped some real some real wisdom on us. Um, Lee, I want to um, raise up that we'll be kind of sharing this video out long after this uh, this particular time. But what's going on in Texas right now is a crisis. And, you know, we heard Crystal speak about mutual aid and about young people driving change um, in community where it feels and seems and the actual reality is that government has actually failed them. 
And so can you share with us what your experience is like on the ground right now in Texas? And I know you're actually multitasking right now and trying to serve the community at the same time. That just goes to show what kind of, you know, the integrated approach that we even talked about here at the ACLU of how, you know, how you how you lift up community and, and, and do all these things at the same time. Um, but talk to us a little bit about what's happening on the ground there and how um, mutual aid and, and other community folks are kind of stepping in and, and filling that breach. Texas is dealing with a natural disaster, right? One caused by inclement weather. Uh, but the crisis is one a failure of government. The crisis is, is, is directly tied to greed um, and power being hoarded by the few. Uh, Texas is one of the few, actually the only states with an independent power grid that they refuse to update because they don't like federal regulations because they feel like it will impact their bottom line. Uh, what, what we're going through in Texas with power outages all, o- all over the state, uh, with people being um, literally freezing to death, people um, being denied food, people um, lacking shelter, uh, is something that was both foreseeable and that it deserves a, a, an appropriate response from our leadership. But unfortunately, we're dealing with an archaic style leadership that thinks, well, Texas has the ninth largest economy in the world. Texas is the largest energy producing state in the country and one of the largest en- energy producers in the world. And so for corporations and the haves, they're fine. And the have not to left to fend for themselves. And so I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting now uh, from um, uh, because I'm outside of my home, like many Texas residents, um, due to uh, the 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 effects of this this again um, crisis of leadership and natural disaster. And I believe the answer is exactly what we're talking about here today. From a ground level, we need to replace the leadership structure in in Texas that has left the people of Texas to fend for themselves. Uh, And this goes directly to people like Senator Ted Cruz, who went on vacation as opposed to meet the immediate crisis. While while people on the ground level, you can see who your who the real leaders are because they're out they're they're out in the streets handing out bottles of water, uh, coordinating food relief, providing shelter in fighting for uh, the people of Texas. Those are the people that we need to be electing in office. Georgia gave us a great example when they, when they turn, turned Texas not blue, but they turned it black. Um, le- leaders uh, in Texas organized and galvanized people on the ground level to take over the state and rescue democracy. Uh, but they also gave us a framework for what to do in Louisiana and what to do in Texas and what to do in Oklahoma and, and the other um, there, there's a new Southern strategy that, that Georgia laid out for us that I think we we should all we can all take advantage of. Thank you so much for sharing that, and I just want to just lift up and you know just take a moment to recognize how many people are displaced right now, how many people are experiencing um, tremendous trauma, and um, you know it's this is something that um, we in Louisiana have a lot of experience with. Unfortunately, um, we've seen many natural disasters that have been compounded and exacerbated by a failed uh, you know, government response at the state, local and the federal level. And we've had a lot of opportunity, a lot of suffering and a lot of loss of life. Um, and I just want to you know, kind of double click on this point that um, holding leadership accountable, right, and how you actually respond in crisis. And, you know, we know that character comes out not in the best of times, but what are you doing in the worst of times? How are you showing up and how are you, how are you leading in times and moments of crises? And we can see clearly that there are responses that um, I think any person of, of reasonableness would say are not appropriate in this kind of situation with such a traumatic um, and devastating loss of life and resources. So I wanna thank you for even being with us today taking the time, being away from your family. And, and, you know, it just goes to show how important and what your commitment is to making sure that you are, um, you know, really representing. And so we're really grateful for that. Um, I want to just um, kind of shift us just a little bit to talk about, um, you know, what we're going to do going forward. And so let's imagine over the next four years, we're building our movement up. We're having wins. We're um, rolling back some of these really um, um, 
unconstitutional policies that that have been enacted over over many, many years. We're creating strategic coalitions that really work. And now it's 2024. What did we accomplish over these four years? What are we advocating for now? So if in a best case scenario, what have we achieved? What are some of those 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 highlights that we're touting and saying we were actually able to, for example, deal with or, or, or create a pathway to citizenship for, for folks and, and immigrants. We were really able to start looking at real resolution and opportunity in ending mass incarceration. I'm just throwing some things out here, but in your heart and in your, um, in your spirit and in your line of work, what are these things that we're constantly reaching for? And what do you think we can accomplish over these next four years? And I'm opening it up to the whole team. I can. Uh, I believe that we can say. Oh, no, go ahead, Lee. No, Miss Boy, please, after you. We'll have Tanika first. Great. A, a thank seven you. Gentleman. A seven gentleman. Well, thank you. Um, I, was going to say, I mean, we are going to be laying the groundwork for the world as it should be, right? And the world as it should be, uh, we should be restoring voting rights. We know locally that so many legislators are trying to take on, uh, especially in places like Georgia to uh, further disenfranchise people, reduce some of the conveniences that should have been rights that we saw during uh, the pandemic. And so in four years, we wanna make sure that we have sound and firm voting rights. We wanna make sure that we're restoring the Voting Rights Act. We wanna make sure that we are expanding fair housing. Fair housing has been critical and crucial for black folks, working class black people across this country we want to make sure that we put a, 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 a indent in this debt and student loan debt. We have a student debt crisis in this country. Uh, black women, working class black women who bear the burden of teaching jobs, who bear the burden of social work, who bear the burden of really uh, the professionals who are keeping our communities together, not just our communities, but the wider America together. We want to make sure that we are we are making sure that they don't have to be straddled by all this student loan debt. So we want to see a, a significant reduction in that student loan debt uh, moving forward. We want to make sure that we've done something to ensure that the post office has the funding and the capacity uh, to, to you know, make sure that people who are incarcerated get their letters, to make sure that during the midterms folks can get their ballots. So we want to restore the post office. And then the last thing I'll say, um, this year is going to be the 50th anniversary of the war on drugs. Uh, we know that so many black men and so many black women are incarcerated because of uh, unjust sentencing, because of all the ways that the drug laws played out when I was growing up um, in the 80s and in the 90s across this country. And so we wanna see people granted mass clemency we want to make sure that mothers are at home with their children. We want to make sure that fathers who are now grandfathers are at home with their kids. And we want to see a drastic reduction in incarceration in the next four years. And I think that's a, a great place, great place for me to pick up on. Uh, I used to teach a, a, a class in, in Atlanta as a, um, a teacher at South Atlanta High School School of Law and Social Justice. And we talked about grassroots organizing in our first the first we, we came up with three A's as a strategy for for organizing. The first was awareness. You had to get people aware of what was going on, familiar with the problem, intimately familiar with it so that they can speak about it intelligently and from an informed basis start to uh, come up with solutions. And I think in the past four years, uh, the awareness piece has set in. People are aware of, of, of the massive problems that we have with our militarized policing, that we spend, uh, um, you know, the bulk of our, but our, our local municipal budgets on an ineffective and militarized policing that does not make us safer. People are aware of it now. Uh, the second part uh, of the 3A system was aware, affronted. The last one was active. Affronted was something that we saw. People were upset about it and they took it personally. So it's it's one thing to understand it, but to take it personally and see how it impacts you and your neighbors. And when you're, you're when you're truly affronted about something, you cannot let it let it go on. And so I think in the past four years we've taken care of the first two A's, uh, but the last A, the active part, I think is is what what lies in front of us. In the next four years, I think that we can send five out of eight people in prison home. Uh, our our, our 
the, our awareness piece has has sort of let us all know that um, um, from this prison industrial complex, we've po- we've criminalized poverty and sickness in a way that is is inhumane, and, and our prison system, uh, as it currently stands, represents a human rights crisis that that needs immediate action. Send uh, the people that that you know the Biden administration and, the, and others have acknowledged were wrongfully incarcerated or uh, disproportionately incarcerated when it, as it relates to uh, um, their actual crimes or their activity, um, uh, that, that there are clear disparities between how black people are treated in, in our court system, how white people are treated. Uh, those people are not only figurative people, they exist in a jail. My father being one of them who is incarcerated today uh, for possession of a, a, a low level quantity of drugs. Uh, now it's time to get active, sending those people home and not only sending them home, but giving them the resources to rebuild their, to rebuild their communities. I believe that it's time to return power to people um, to figure out public safety or reimagine public safety on a local level. And I believe all of those things in terms of what we do with all of this knowledge and all this energy that that has sprung up in the past four years to build actual solutions is what we have in front of us. Absolutely. I feel like everybody's voice should be um, should be lifted up on this topic. So I'm going to come to you, Jashika. So. You know, I, I'm listening to everyone speak and I'm kind of closing my eyes and just reimagining justice, right? And so if we accomplish everything that was spoken about um, from Tanika and, and Lee, we're still scratching the surface, right? Everything that we that we have been talking about is still rectifying the the, the harms of the past, right? The racial inequalities, um, uh, the, the extreme racism, the structural structural racism, we're still starting as a deficit. And so um, I'm glad Tanika mentioned clemency. Like, that's something actually President Biden can do tomorrow, right? With a stroke of pen, with a pen he can dramatically reduce the federal prison system, uh, population. And so I know uh, the ACLU is, is part of that movement, part of that drumbeat of uh, pressuring Biden to, to use his presidential pardoning um, powers, right? Um, so the, that's what we talk about, like the accountability and the movement, keeping that energy up. Um, with the mass incarceration, I find, I hope we finally get to the point where we can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? Implementing real uh, sustainable measures that will really reduce the jail and prison population in this country, like mandatory minimums, right? Ending truth and sentencing provisions, instead of just focusing on, which are great, um, ending cash bail and ban the box. But those are, those are pre, those don't get to the heart of uh, the j- jail and prison population in this country, right? And so we need to tackle those harder uh, provisions, those measure- measures that don't always feel good, right? It's hard to create a narrative um, that you can wrap in a nice tiny box around um, mandatory minimums and, and truth and sentencing provisions, right? Um, felony murder, things like that, the, the harder things to kind of to, to digest, right? So I hope we really get to, into a habit of having real conversations in 20, um, by 2024 so we can really affect substantial um, and systematic changes. Um, you know, I also think about in this country, you know, we love to say that we're running the same race, right? We're not, right? If 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 my lane has a hurdle um, and my shoe is untied and I have holes in my shoes, right? Like we might start at the same point, but we're not going to run the same race. And so really having those real conversations, um, you know, I give a lot of homage to uh, the great Jeff Robinson, right? You know, he talks about having those conversations. He ran around the country having those conversations. Um, so just... Right. So getting into a place where it's like, it's okay to have the uncomfortable conversations. Um, If we're sitting in rooms like this and always comfortable and having these cozy conversations, what change are we really affecting? And so that's what I really hope we get into in 2024. I mean, I will be honest with you. We have a very short um, runway. Uh, You know, we talk about 2024, the elections just happened. We have roughly 18 months to really get this right and make some real um, substantial changes because 
right now, our side, um, and I guess whatever side you want to, you know, consider, the more progressive side has a supermajority in Congress, right? And so we shouldn't be coming into these positions as um, already in a position of compromise, right? We need to go big. We need to be bold, right? And we have the opportunity to do so, right? So we can't get to 2024 if we're not even there in 2022. So I just hope that um, we really start having those real conversations that will lead us into victory in 2024. Wonderful. So we're going to hear from Crystal. And then because we're on our last couple of minutes, I want to ask everyone in just one or two sentences what folks who are listening in the audience can do to help support. But Crystal, I'll give you the last word on this conversation of what we will have accomplished in 2024 if everything goes well. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I want to see every single thing uh, that my fellow panelists <laughs> said. Come to fruition. I really, I really do. Right. And to pick up on what you were saying, Dashika, about like getting to the nitty gritty. Um, I feel like when we, when we have truly done that, we will be in a place where we're no longer begging to be invested in. We're no longer having to beg and yell that our lives have value and are worth the investment um, and are contributing something to society because you have to fundamentally believe that um, in order to to have the conversations that are less comfortable and more um, in the weeds. Um, so I, you know, I'm hoping that that's a place that we can get to because even when I'm thinking about young people. Um, they're full of hope for a time, right? But people, you can't have your spirit kind of beat out of you. And it does take a toll when you have to constantly just focus on like um, the big broad, like I'm a person, <laughs> like let's pass the legislation that even, you know, saves my life. I mean, just to focus on gun violence quickly, you know, 40,000 people per year die by guns. And that is an epidemic. Um, and we have to make a dent in that or else we're going to let a generation of predominantly young uh, black men and women, um, you know, slip by. Um, and that does require that pivot that you were saying to Sheikha, like, yeah, I hope we do get an assault um, rifle ban passed while we have this super majority. It's like the only window of opportunity to do it for like the next, you know, uh, 15 years. I hope that happens. But I also hope that we can talk about it at a level that's a real human conversation level and is not this like gun violence prevention campaign that that is constantly happening where we're talking about all those other forces that fuel gun violence in our country. And we're talking about, um, you know, gun glorification and the access to guns. And we're talking about, um, you know, all of these things in um, community that force people, like I said, to pick up guns. We have to be able to um, get to those conversations in order um, for us to make real progress. But I hope that when we do, I hope that when we do, um, that Gen Z will be in a position in 2024 um, to run for the offices that they're qualified for, right? Um, that they will at that point be thought of um, as current leaders and not just rising or future leaders, because hopefully they will have been, you know, part of um, these rooms to make these changes happen. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I hope we actually get a study committee to actually study gun violence as a health and public health epidemic. If we don't actually study it, we know that's the reason why if we can't get to studying the issue, what we can, we cannot solve what we do not diagnose. So amen on that, Crystal. And just so in our closing, I want to hear everyone's voice. If, if you can do it in a word, boo, beautiful. If you can do it in two or three words, great. I will kind of kick us off what you can do, donate. Whether it's to mutual aid, whether it's to your um, Black-led organization of choice, whether it's to the ACLU, um, donate. Dashika. Relational organizing. Have conversations with the people you know, right? Any. It, it doesn't take a degree to do that. Everyone knows people, you, you know, your family, your 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 community, your church um, community. Have those important conversations. Education is key. So I just really believe in community, uh, relational organizing. Organizing. Tanika. Yeah, I agree with Dashika. Re relational. Or we're organizers. You know, uh, you have to get into community. You have to get into institutions. Allow yourself to fall in love with an issue. If it moves your heart, let it move your feet or move your hands. Um, and please join peoplepower.org and we will get you uh, towards some action. We'll get you. Look, we got a job for you. If you want one, you got a job for you. Lee. 
grassrootslaw.org. Every, I echo everything that Tashika and Tanika and even, even you said, but uh, grassrootslaw.org is how you can connect directly with some of the work that, that, that I'm, I'm directly connected to. Thank you. And Crystal, final word. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I would say research and amplify. This goes back to the point that every single person every day has a role to play in making this change. And we won't know about it. We like the major organizations and movements only have but so much capacity. We want to support with the money and resources that we have. But bring these gaps to our attention, you know, post about it and then talk about it. Right. Like get it shared within your community um, so that we can do something about it. And um, if you want to, you know, follow more on the gun violence prevention movement and everything that we'll be up to at March for Our Lives to kind of address political apathy, corruption, and get something done on guns, um, you can text CHANGE to 954-954. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I could continue this conversation for hours with these leaders. You all have heard from, uh, I think, folks who are going to be changing our national landscape. Watch out for these leaders. These are the change makers of our society. And you too are change makers. And so let us all join in this movement together. But I want to thank these incredible guests. I want to say thank you to Crystal. Thank you to Shika. Thank you, Lee. And thank you, Tanika. We will be cheering you on and following you and supporting you. And happy Black History Month, everyone. <laughs>